here. Um, I'm going to be leading you through Read Aloud for Monday, May 4th. Um, I'm really excited to do this with you. We're going to be reading some chapters from Front Desk. Um, I really love this book. I hope you do too. And um, I'm going to review some because it's been a little while since we've read this book. Um, so some of our characters, a new character we met last time is Uncle Ming, who owes $5,000 to loan sharks. Um, this was to fix a car um, and loan sharks are some people who are really dangerous to try to get your money um, when you when you give them, when they let you borrow money. Jason Yao got bullied at school for being Chinese. Um, he goes to the same school as Mia and she had seen him get bullied and tried to stand up for him. But ultimately she doesn't like Jason. Um, the motel guest. So we saw in the last couple chapters in nine and 10, Mia was developing more of like a friendly relationship with the guests playing Monopoly with them. Um, they were helping each other. They were really understanding of the washing machine being broken. So that's a relationship that's developing right now. The setting is, there's a few settings, the Cali Vista Motel, and then we've also had a few scenes at the school that Mia goes to. Um, and all this is taking place in Southern California. Uh, and she described her neighborhood a little bit where a lot of the people there live in nice houses, have dogs and yards, but there's some people there who don't have as much money. Um, and there are signs that the neighborhood is not as nice as you might think it is at first glance. So some additions to the plot that we've been seeing. So the Mattel's washing machine broke. Mia and her parents came together to try to resolve the issue. Um, they found other rather fun ways to wash the towels, such as putting them all in a bathtub and kind of playing around. So I thought that that was really bringing the family together. We also saw Mia grow more responsible, especially around the hotel. She was finding new ways to help and trying to be really responsible with the customers. Mr. Yao continues to be quite mean. Um, both Mia's family and the motel guests are pretty unhappy with his meanness. Like they, they see him as an unpleasant person. So as we read today, our teaching point, what we're going to be thinking about is the character traits, their relationships, the point of view of the narrator and possible themes, as well as any changes to some story elements. Let's get started. Chapter 11. Uncle Ming stayed for three days until he could get his car fixed. With his broken English, he had a hard time communicating with garages, so I helped him call one up that was close by. At first, they weren't so keen to help. I'm noticing already, like, Mia's really trying to be caring once again. She tends to be a really caring person, but here she is trying to help her uncle communicate with the people at the car garage. When they heard my voice, they said, Sorry, we don't work on toy cars. Hmm, I'm kind of thinking the garage workers were being actually a little bit racist here. Um, they probably see a Chinese person and didn't really want to help him. And they even said when they heard my voice. Um, so I'm thinking that they're being a little bit racist. Or it could be that, you know, they think like, oh, she's a kid. We're going to work on toys. I think it's a combination of racism and also, you know, not wanting to help a kid. I called back and this time... I borrowed a line from my customers. I'd like to speak to the manager, I said. In the end, I got the manager to send someone over to the motel to take a look at Uncle Ming's car. I also think it's really cool how Mia is like applying her knowledge and skills from the motel to this situation. She's learned about the whole speaking to the manager thing and she's using it here. The repair guy told Uncle Ming he had a radiator problem. They managed to drive the car over to the garage where they fixed it for him. But when it came time to settle the bill, Uncle Ming came horribly short. We'd given him $50, which was just about all the extra cash we had, with what Mr. Yao changing the deal and making us pay for the washing machine. But the total bill was $200. So then Uncle Ming tried something crazy. He tried to pay the rest in coupons. He'd been collecting coupons from all over, there were coupons for free chicken nuggets at McDonald's, free haircuts at Supercuts, and free frozen yogurt. 
There were even coupons for free foot massages. You can't pay in coupons, the garage manager wailed. What am I going to do with free foot massages? We'll take them, his mechanic splurted out from the back of the garage. I'm thinking maybe they want some massages. Um, so I noticed in the scene, like, there was just an ongoing struggle that Mia's family, including Uncle Ming, is experiencing. That's just, they struggle with poverty. Um, you know, he really was coming up short with $200. He was trying to pay in coupons. This isn't something that all people experience. This is somebody um, who's living short economically would experience. Please, sir, Uncle Ming begged the manager, is all I have. The manager looked at Uncle Ming for a while, and after much deliberation, he sighed. He took the $50 and the coupons, which he distributed to his mechanics. Everybody cheered. I couldn't believe it. We all waved as Uncle Ming drove away. He promised to return soon and to pay my parents back the $50. My dad told him not to worry about it and to focus on getting far, far away from the loan sharks. In school that week, Mrs. Douglas asked us to write about a short story. I really wanted to write about the loan sharks, but I didn't know if that was too out there. So I tried to look around to see what other people were writing. I'm noticing Mia really like kind of wants to fit in. Like she didn't want her story to be so different from other kids, even though it was a true story. And she kind of wanted to see, hmm, what were the other kids writing? Next to me, Jason was scrib scribbling furiously, covering his words with his hand as he wrote. I leaned over, trying to peek at his writing, but Jason shifted his body, blocking my view with his arm. Great. Now he has an arm wall. I wonder why Jason so badly wants to keep his story private. He turned to me and hissed, Stop it! Then narrowed his eyes at me. Mia, eyes on your own paper, please, Mrs. Douglas frowned. She said it like I was cheating. I opened my mouth in protest, then closed it. I blew at my bangs in frustration instead and plunged my eyes down at the blank page in front of me. Remember, show, not tell. Write what you feel, kids, Mrs. Douglas announced to the class. If you're mad, write mad. If you're sad or you're worried, write sad and worried. I was all those things. I thought about Uncle Ming and his black eye and the way his voice rose and fell like a curtain when he said, What do I do, buddy? They're going to kill me. But when I put down my pencil onto the paper, do you know what marched onto the page? Puppies and houses. Hmm, I'm wondering if Mia maybe like wrote kind of a made up story or lied in her story because she doesn't have a puppy and she doesn't live in a house. But I know that she wants to say this to try to fit in. At lunch, Lupe sat next to me picking at her turkey sandwich while I gobbled up my free school spaghetti. Why were you looking at Jason's paper, Lupe asked. You don't like him, do you? Are you kidding? I can't stand him. Good, because he's terrible, Lupe said. You don't even know the half of it, I muttered, shaking my head. So what did you write about? I wrote about how last weekend my parents and I waited in line at the movies for an hour. And when we finally got up to the ticket booth, lady, they were sold out. Isn't that sad? That is super sad, I said. Wishing, hoping, one day. That would be my super sad. What about you? What do you do this weekend, she asked. I turned to tell her about Uncle Ming, then thought, nah, she wouldn't get it. That was so beyond the world of movies and trampolines and Shiba Inus. Mm, just played with my dog, I lied. So I, I noticed here the authors highlighting the difference between Mia and other kids at the school um, they live really different lives, and the reason they have different lives is because they have different amounts of money. So, you know, Mia doesn't have a dog, doesn't um, live in a house. Her story was about these loan sharks, um, but that's not the case for her classmates who are more maybe middle class. After lunch, we went to PE. We were playing softball that day. Both Lupe and I stood way out in left field, as far away from the action as we could, since we both hated sports. Actually, I didn't really hate sports. We just didn't have any medical insurance, and my parents didn't want me taking any chances. What if you break your arm, my mom asked when I started going to school in America. What if a ball comes flying, hits you in the head, and you have to have stitches? Back in China, this would have been no problem. 
as my uncle was a doctor. Whenever I got sick, he'd come over and take care of me. My uncle always wore his stethoscope around his neck. When we left for America, he gave it to my dad to take with him. I wish I could take you with me, my dad said to his brother. I'm sure there are doctors in America, my uncle said with a chuckle. It turns out there were doctors, just not for us. So what I think this is alluding to here is the fact that, you know, in America, not everybody has access to health care. And health care, paying for doctors, hospitals, doctor's appointments can be really expensive and not everybody can afford that. Um, so she's like, yeah, there's doctors in America, but not for us immigrants, not for us poor people. Um, so a social issue I saw coming up is unequal access to health care in America. So my mom made me promise every morning that I'd stay on the sidelines during gym class. It wasn't always easy to just stand and watch, but now at least I had Lupe with me. Today we were so busy chatting, we didn't even notice when the softball landed right next to us. Lupe glanced at the ball and went right back to chatting. She didn't even pick it up. She must really hate sports. And that is the end of chapter 11. We're going to go on to chapter 12. Chapter 12. Instead of going straight home after school that day, I took the long way back, stopping at various restaurants. I was collecting brochures for the front office. Mr. Yao may be an unbelievable sheepskake, but there were some free things we could do to spruce up the place, like putting flyers out for the local establishments or collecting customers' mailing addresses, which I already started doing. Anytime a customer checked in, I asked them for their home address, so if they left something behind, I could mail it back to them. So I'm noticing here, like, Mia's just being so caring, not only for the motel itself and the way it's run, um, but also for the customers. I was in the middle of sorting through the mountain of brochures and menus when a slightly disheveled looking white man walked up and tapped on the glass. He was tapping furiously, like it was an emergency, so I buzzed him in. That was when it hit me, the sour stench of sweat and alcohol. My throat tightened as the wave of stink crashed into the room. That man was completely drunk. I should not have buzzed him in. I need a room, he slurred, stumbling toward me. He steadied himself by holding onto the front desk with both hands. Give me a room. Uh, I need to go to get my parents. Wait right here, I told him, desperate to get away from this guy. As I hopped off the stool, I realized, wait a minute, I can't leave him here. He could reach over and take all our cash from the cash drawer. He had to go back out. Actually, can you wait outside? I asked timidly. He did not like the sound of that. The man turned to me with his bloodshot eyes and pounded his hand on the counter. What did you say? He bellowed. My mind was racing. I could probably still get out of there if I let him stay inside. But then what about the cash? Please, sir, I tried again. I just need you to wait outside. Why? Why can't I stay right here, he demanded. You just can't, I shouted. I glanced out the window, searching for my parents, but they were still upstairs cleaning. So I noticed Mia's probably feeling really unsafe right now. Um, he's, you know, grabbing her and, um, you know, not listening to her. So she's probably getting, feeling really unsafe. Um, and now she's probably feeling a bit scared because you know, she can't get her parents' attention. Suddenly, he grabbed, my sh grabbed me by my shirt. Are you jerking me around, kid? Are you? No, sir. I shook my head from side to side. His rancid breath stung my eyes. With my fingers, I tried to reach for the phone, but his grip on my shirt was too tight. Please, just calm down, I pleaded with him. I thought maybe I could distract him with all my restaurant brochures. Hey, are you hungry? I have a bunch of menus. I don't want to see some damn menu, he screamed into my face. I want a motel room. The next thing I knew, he pounded on the counter so hard, the wood nearly chipped. I screamed. Tears streamed down my face. Through the blur of my tears, I saw a figure outside banging on the front office door. It was Hank. 
quickly I reached down and pressed on the buzzer. Hank stormed inside. What the hell do you think you're doing? Hank hollered at the drunk man. Let her go. The drunk man instantly dropped his hands and I gasped for air like I'd been holding my breath the entire time. Hank raised his fists. Get out of here before I called the cops, he yelled. The drunk man dragged himself out the front office, muttering under his breath. She was jerking me around, man. When he finally disappeared around the corner, Hank turned to me. You all right, he asked. I shook my head. I lifted the divider and collapsed into his arms. I clung to him and cried, shaking with fear, blind with gratitude. What would have happened to me had Hank not come in? The thought crushed the breath out of me. Shh, it's okay, Hank comforted me, patting my arm. So I'm feeling like Hank and Mia's relationship is really deepening here. Um, You know, at first they were like being friendly, you know, they were kind of getting more acquainted with each other, but now I feel like their relationship is starting to really deepen into, you know, some more trust and some more love. So I said Hank and Mia had had a friendly bond, but now they have a deeper, more trusting bond. But it wasn't okay. I thought I could make the front desk better with all my spare keys and comment cards, but no card in the world could protect me from what I'd been avoiding since day one. One wrong buzz, and it was all over. This was not fun and games. This was not just fun and games. This was dangerous. All right, you guys. Thank you for reading chapters 11 and 12 with me. Um, I know that got pretty intense and scary at the end. I know it felt kind of scary for me, um, and I really empathize with Mia's experience. It's it's scary to have some a stranger kind of accost you or threaten you, make you feel unsafe. Um, yeah, so thanks for hanging in there with me. Um, so you guys are going to answer the short response question. Um, so make sure you look um, in your class assignment for the short response question. It's going to be asking you about how inequality affects members of the Tang family's lives. Um, So I know we talked about that throughout this read aloud video. So now I want you to do a little bit of writing about that and be sure that you include some text evidence. Can't wait to see what you write.